And now, in the darkest hours of the night. Ladies and gentlemen, Bruce Collins. You ready? Chad Miles. Let's go. Theater of the Mind. The Bruce Collin Show. With the Baron of Broadcasting. Welcome back to the Bruce Collins Show. We're very glad to have you join us. Tonight we get the latest news and opinions on our Second Amendment rights with Larry Pratt of Gun Owners of America. The Bruce Collins Show airs every Thursday night at 10 p.m. on WWPR, 1490 a.m. You can also catch the show on Fridays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time online at ipbn-fm.com. That's ipbn-fm.com. Please tell your friends about The Bruce Collins Show, and you can join us on Facebook at The Bruce Collins Show page. If you'd like to contact us, you can email us at Bruce underscore Collins underscore show at AOL.com. We also have a new website, TheBruceCollinsShow.com. The Bruce Collins Show also has a YouTube channel. Visit YouTube, search for The Bruce Collins Show channel, subscribe, and catch all the latest shows on YouTube. And we also do a program on Monday nights on ipbn-fm.com called The Big Finale. Well, if you subscribe to the Bruce Collins Show channel on YouTube, you get both The Bruce Collins Show and The Big Finale right there on The Bruce Collins Show YouTube channel. And now let me introduce my co-host, Chad Miles. Chad is a former congressional candidate in Michigan and a military veteran and is the founder and webmaster at Conspiria.net and zippycheese.com. You can also find out more information on Chad at chadmiles.com. He is radio's lethal weapon, Chad Miles. Welcome back to the program, Chad. Oh, hey, Bruce. Sorry, I was just taking a Zippy Cheese Star Wars quiz. Excellent. It's yes. awesome. Yes. Check that, it out. And that, and that would be at zippycheese.com, I bet. Yes, it would. Yes. Excellent. So, you know, I guess we will never hear, after the last time we talked to Jekyllberry DuPont Jr., it's my guess now that we will never hear from him again. Oh, so is he now in the mental health facility? Yeah, he's probably locked up forever. I take it you're relieved? Yes. That whole situation was a real strain on me. Now I just have to get Social Media Jones, Social Media Jones, Social Media Jones to finish the commercial he promised, and then I'll feel like my life is back in order. What? Wow, you mean he's not done with that commercial yet? Hey, Chad, he promised he'll have it ready in the next couple of weeks. Well, if you don't have some type of problem going on, how will you spend your days? I'm working on some research projects. Oh, yeah, research for what? A new book, and this book is going to be a bestseller. I'm going to explore a lot of topics that other authors are afraid to explore. Hmm, like what? Well, for instance, if people wear their hearts on their sleeves, what clothing do they use to wear their other body parts? Are you being serious? That's just a figure of speech. No, Chad, it's real. Oh, boy, we just took another left turn, I'm afraid. Well, uh, tell me what other topics you're going to explore. Okay, here's one. How come there is never a garage for sale at a garage sale? I think because you're selling the stuff in the garage. Then it should be a stuff in the garage sale. Well, maybe. Well, what other riveting subjects are you looking into? 
Well, topics such as, why aren't birds tickled by feathers? Why do kamikaze pilots wear helmets? And why do they call it a TV set when you only get one? Wow, this book sounds like it's going to be a real page-turner. Oh, yeah. There will definitely be pages in this book. (laughs) So what do you hope to accomplish with the new book? Chad, I'm like everybody else. I want to be filthy, stinking rich. Well, you already got the filthy and stinking parts. Thank you for your encouragement, Chad. You're welcome, Bruce. Actually, I'm working on a second book, and I want to tell you about this. This is just as riveting and just as deep research as the first book. I'm looking into our last three presidents, and it's really weird. Nobody's ever talked about this before, so I think I'm on to something that nobody has even looked into. And it's kind of conspiratorial, I have to warn you. Mm, But but if you look at the last three presidents, George W. Bush, Mm -hmm. he beat around the bush until 9-11. And now, hmm. the, and now you have the, pre, the our latest president. We had eight years of terrorism, and the man's name is Obama. Hmm. Now, let me say that slowly so our our listener can can understand. Obama, terrorism. I never thought of that. And now, everybody is noticing that Hillary Clinton has gained a significant amount of weight. She wears pants because they call her ankles cankles. And her name is Clin Tun. And after the election, they say she's going to be so heavy that she might have a double Clin. I mean, chin. So you've got Clin Tun, Obama, and George W. Bush. So the the title I'm calling is Presidential Names have meaning this is this is one in a million book so you've got to buy it interesting yes now chad i always think of you as the o n g the original o n g the original news gangsta oh, so i just okay. have one question for you do you have any news for us this week why as a matter of fact i do Wow. Milwaukee's WITI TV, in an on scene report from Loretta, Wisconsin, in the state's northwest backwoods, in May, described the town's baffling fascination with wood tick racing. Wow. Held annually, provided someone finds enough wood ticks to place in a circle so that the townspeople can wager on which one hops out first. The, <laughs> the races began 37 years ago, and this year, Howard was declared the winner. According to the organizers, at the end of the day, all contestants except Howard were to be smashed with a mallet. Nice. It's from, as I said earlier, that's from WITI-TV. I've got a great marketing slogan for WITI. They should say, WITI, we're witty. Hey, by the way, I've heard of Howard the Duck, and now I've heard of Howard the Wood Tick. Howard the Wood Tick. So he doesn't get smashed with a mallet, but then what happens to him? Oh, he gets to reside in a in somebody's pet. <laughs> Have you ever tried to smash a tick? No, but I... I it's I, very difficult. My grandfather was quite a tongue twister, so they say. And uh, not that he was a tongue twister. He said a lot of tongue twisters. I should... Elucidate, and uh, one of the things I learned was how much can a wood tick tick if a wood tick couldn't tick wood. Hmm. That's or maybe it was, maybe it's woodchuck. I can't. Well, remember. let's let's move on from wood ticks whoa, 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 to tree frogs. Wait a minute. They say what? I just have one thing though about this. Okay. They Sorry. say that the races began 37 years ago, right? Yep. And you have to wonder how did this take place. Is it was it like some guy? Some, How did it start? Right. Yeah, somebody's wife said, "Cletus, get the ticks off the dog and do something productive." I, said, I think they're racing. Yeah, I think they're trying to get off that dog as fast as possible. Because I'm going to hit him with a mallet. Let's start a wood tick racing club. 
Yeah, what an interest. And this is Milwaukee. No, no, it's uh, Loretta, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, okay. yeah. So, I mean, they pro- there you go. <laughs> they probably don't have Journey going through their town or, you know, other popular venues, Bald concerts. Like- Moving on from ticks to tree frogs. An ordinary green tree frog recently injured in a... <laughs> In a lawn mowing accident. Now, was he pushing the lawn mower, or no? Yeah, that that would have been a, a very strange incident yeah. if the if tree frog was pushing the lawn mower. A lawn mowing accident in Australia's outback was flown about six hundred miles from Mount Issa to the Cairns Frog Hospital. There's a frog hospital. Yeah. CFH President Deborah Pergolotti spoke despairingly despairingly to Australian Broadcasting Corporation News in June about how society underregards the poor frogs when it comes to rescue and rehab, suggesting that there's almost a glass ceiling, her words, be, between them and the cuter animals. That's from the Australian Broadcast Corporation. Everybody's so nice to the kangaroos. I don't, but I don't think she cares. understands what the term glass ceiling really means. Nobody cares about the frogs. They're ugly. You know, in the, in this is Australia, so you've got koalas, kangaroos. I mean, there's some very interesting animals in Australia. Yeah, so and, I guess tree frogs don't really rate very high. And this was not a domesticated tree frog. So we're talking a homeless tree frog. They shipped, they flew 600 miles. Miles. Who is paying for that? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. Who's paying and for it's that? It's a it's a tree frog. I mean, are they? They have to be relatively common. It says an ordinary tree frog, green yeah. tree frog. Now, when they say in Australia's outback, are they talking about that restaurant? No. <laughs> Highly unlikely. Yeah, the fry cook is the one who flew. Yeah, we were trying the- to kill the tree frog and serve him at the outback steakhouse. <laughs> and he Name was out back. You frog legs. He was out back mowing the lawn and had an accident. <laughs> outback. Now, they say there's rescue and rehab. So I'm thinking rehab. So you see, I can just imagine a bunch of frogs sitting around and say, hey, what are you in here for? I was smoking the bark off a of eucalyptus. <laughs> Man, that was some good stuff. They got me sober now. I'm going to hop on out of here. <laughs> or is that a different kind of rehab? I don't know. You never know. It's yeah. Australia. And, the, and there's and, a Karen Frog Hospital. Yeah, that is bizarre. Never heard of it. Speaking of bizarre. And rehab. <laughs> yeah. When they were starting out, the band Guns N' Roses practiced and lived in a storage unit in Los Angeles. Hey, Chad. Uh, yes. I have to say that back then I was a fan of Guns N' Roses. I actually knew that. I, do you rem- remember reading about they were basically a homeless band? Oh yeah, yeah, that was well known. There, there were several bands like that. I think Dokken. Remember the band yeah. Dokken from the eighties? They were like homeless for a while, and yeah. that was actually more common than you think. Yes, because a lot of money got spent on bad stuff. Yes, yes, it did. And there wasn't a lot of money, quite frankly. And in, in, uh, once you paid everybody and and uh, took care of all the equipment and everything, there probably wasn't a lot of money in. Yeah, that's before they were lighting cigars with $100 bills and things like that, among other things. Yeah. Uh, They practiced and lived in a storage unit in Los Angeles. According to a book review review essay in the May 2016 Harper's Magazine and became resourceful, wrote the essayist. Bass player Duff McKagan wrote in one of the books reviewed, you could get dirt cheap antibiotics intended for use in aquariums at pet stores, and it turned out that tetracycline wasn't just good for tail rot and gill disease. It also did great with syphilis. And that's from Harper's. That's from Harper's. So so the surprise wasn't that they all had syphilis. The surprise was that they were using aquarium drugs. And I wonder how they, they took it. I don't know. Did they did they like inject it or ingest it? I read that article and further down, Duff McKagan, who was known as Duff Rose McKagan, 
uh, actually said that fish food mixed with water makes for a great hemorrhoid cream. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> yes, it's a great topical ointment. We all had syphilis, so we had some fish, and we just used the dirt cheap antibiotics oh, from boy. the aquarium. Those were the eighties were were really strange yes. decade. It was a really strange decade. Moving on. Northern Ireland's Belfast Telegraph reported in April that a man was hospitalized after throwing bricks at the front window of a PIPS office that stands for Public Initiative for Prevention of Suicide and Self Harm. He was injured by the brick bounce back off the shatterproof glass. So I mean Rod Serling would have a field day with that. The guy nearly killed himself throwing a brick at a suicide prevention and self-harm uh, building. Oh, the irony. Yeah. What I've seen uh, I've seen a video on the Internet where a person, and I thought it was fake, maybe it's real, but he was throwing the same thing. He threw a brick at a win- at like this kind of window, and it bounced back and, and hit him and knocked him out. Yeah, I've heard of that happening at a convenience store. Uh, the the guy reinforced the glass, and a guy was going to try to break in, and he threw it at the glass, and it bounced back, hit him in the head, knocked him out, and the police showed up and arrested him. <laughs> Crazy. We man. love dumb we love dumb criminals. I guess was this? Yeah. A, I guess it was kind of a criminal act. Yeah, that's definitely. I don't know. Well, in Belfast, who knows? But I would say probably. Oh boy! Moving on. Here's a news update from Kim Jong-un's North Korea. In March, a South Korean ecology organization reported that the traditional winter migration of vultures from China was unusually skipping over North Korea, headed directly for the south, apparently because of the scarcity of animal corpses. According to reports, that's a major food source for millions of North Koreans. Wow, that's sad. You know, I was in, I was stationed in Korea in the 90s, and um, they weren't in very good shape. North Korea wasn't in very good shape back then as far as food and, and hunger. Um, I can't imagine. It's, this is 20 years later. I can't imagine what it's like now. That's some serious anecdotal evidence, though, when vultures pass over an entire country. Yeah, that, is, that is serious. They can't find animal corpses. I mean, that, that, that is saying a lot, if you think about it. That's wild. I never, Crazy. Yeah, I've never heard of that before. Now, I, I, I see the next story, and um, <laughs> I interviewed a guy by the name of Boomer the Dog. Yes, Boomer. And he, you know, he obviously thinks he's a dog, and he dresses like a dog and all of that. And I have to say that... It's easy to dismiss this stuff because it's not around us. We don't experience it. But there are a lot of people that are involved in this kind of crazy stuff. And uh, to the point where our highest downloaded show, and I don't know, it might have been partly be, just be, been because the topic was so unusual, but our by thousands, our largest downloaded show was the interview with Boomer the dog by far, really? by far, wow! Thousands upon thousands of people. It was insane how many people were interested in Boomer the dog. So, you and and I know that he advertised the show. So it was like a lot of people that go to these strange conventions. They call them furry and all that. Ah, uh, crazy. And really, when you think about it, when, when you live in a world where the morals are. are constantly being redefined by government uh you know who now can say this stuff is abnormal well that's a good point i think this is a good indicator of how off track we are as a society yeah and how uh how easy we have it as a society yeah um i think we're a little too spoiled but let's read the story without further ado so people know what we're talking about Life is good now for British men who identify as dogs and puppies, as evidenced by a BBC documentary called Secret Life of the Human Pups. Showing men in body outfits, one a lycra-suited Dalmatian named Spot. I'm a Dalmatian. (laughs) I'm a Dalmatian. I got my lycra suit on. (laughs) 
exhibiting sexual expressions such as stomach rubbing, ear tickling, and nuzzling their handlers. Okay. Eating, eating out of bowls, gnawing on chew toys, wearing collars so as to not be a stray, and j- jumping in the air for treats. Said Spot, a.k.a. Tom, it's about being given license to behave in a way that feels natural, even primal. An added boot brush. <laughs> this, this guy calls himself boot brush. We, <laughs> we are trying to grasp the positive elements of the archetype of the dog. Yeah. And that's from The Guardian in the UK. And Spot also said, we treat our syphilis with aquarium antibiotics. No. <laughs> that is so messed up. That is. What? I, <clears throat> I don't know. When I talk to Boomer, which is not his real name, obviously. His parents didn't name him that. But he, he thinks he's a dog. That's what's crazy. He actually thinks he's a dog. Or he thinks well, it's in his DNA or something like it's that. It's like people who go through body modification. Like there's this one person, <clears throat> excuse me, who identifies as a cat or a tiger or something. And he's done all these body modifications, tattoos and, and different things to look like a, a tiger. It's yeah. just, it's the most bizarre thing. I mean, we're talking extreme body modification that this, this person has done. It's just, I don't understand that. It's crazy. I have a question, and this is scary because it just flashed across my mind. You don't suppose that Jekyll Berry DuPont Jr. <laughs> is wearing a lycra-suited Dalmatian uh, get-up in the mental institution, do you? Hmm. Oh, in- man. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I think he would actually be dressed in a lycra suit, dressed as a unicorn. Yeah, that that is true. I can see that. You know what, though? i got to stop thinking about him because he is never going to darken my door again. Okay, well, let's move on to you, a new you story. You mentioned here. cats, too, which is a good segue. Video surfaced in May <laughs> of students at Winston Churchill High School in San Antonio, Texas, actually playing jump rope with the intestines of cats. What? That had been dissected in biology class. Wait, who? what cla- biology class dissects cats? We did frogs when yeah, I was. Yeah, we did kid. frogs too. Cats? That's like a pet. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a high school dissecting cats? Uh, no, I haven't. I've never heard of that. Anyways, they were playing uh, jump rope with the intestines <laughs> of the cats. Jump rope. Obviously, people for the ethical treatment of animals, PETA, was not pleased. But school district officials called the exercise a valid demonstration of the tensile strength of the organ and only reluctantly agreed to investigate further. You know, this is one time where I kind of agree with PETA, although PETA would never go to bat for human life. I don't know. There's just something unnerving about kids playing with cat intestines as a jump rope. And are they that long? Yeah. Yeah. That you could do that, and, and you know this is Texas. So you, you Peta, can you imagine PETA going there? And, ah, sir, we understand you. Uh, your kids were playing with the intestines. Now listen, this is Texas. We play with the intestines of cats and jump rope or anything else. They did it right after target practice at lunch. Yeah, with their shotguns. Everything's bigger in Texas, even our intestines. See, look how big these cat intestines are. Yeah. We're going to jump rope with these intestines, and you're going to stand back, little Peter man. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> and then they, and then the school stood up for the kids. Wow. Texas. So Don't you, mess with Texas. So you wonder, did like the school officials know, we're out of jump rope. I know, let's use the intestines of cats that we get it's from biology. Probably the biology teacher's idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stand back, kids. I'm going to show you something. And this, rep- and they didn't even report that. Only like five feet away, kids were playing marbles with cat eyes. Yeah. <laughs> it was pandemonium. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Final story. As Libya's central bank struggles to stabilize a halting economy, it could surely use the estimated $184 million dollars <laughs> In gold and silver coins that Muammar Gaddafi minted but left buried in an underground vault in the coastal city of Beta. 
but the treasure is inaccessible because the central bank officials don't know the lock's combination. <laughs> Did, like, Momar take it to the grave with him? Yeah. As the Wall Street yeah. Journal reported in May, the latest plan is to have a locksmith squ- squeeze through a 16 by 16 inch hole what? in the outer vault's concrete wall and once inside to try his hand. If unsuccessful, the government's bureaucrats likely cannot get paid. But even if successful, various anti-government factions may go to extremes to snatch the coins. Now, so that's from the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, this was a few weeks ago, and I tried to look for an update, and I don't see that they've opened the vault yet. But, you know, call me kind of skeptical, which I am on a lot of things, but they say it's estimated 184 million. Why would they pick 184 million estimated to be in a vault that they can't get into? How do they know what's in the vault? Like, exactly, they can't get into it. Like, well, why are they coming up with 184? It reminds me of when I was a kid, there was a, a kid that did a book review on whales, and I guess he didn't want to get uh, blamed for plagiarism or copying his book report. So every time he came to the weight, the average weight of a of a way of a different kind of whale, he'd say one pound as the like he'd say one thousand three hundred and one pound, and then the next one he'd say this whale is one thousand five hundred and one pound. <laughs> And, and it, that's almost what this reminds me of. It's like 184 million. Yeah, like, right. like they don't know what's behind this vault. You know In what? A 16 by 16 square. That's not very big. Yeah. You for, know, for, for a full grown man to fit through. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Libya needs to go to Fox. Go to Merpert. Merpert. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> A.K.A. Murpert, <laughs> go to Rupert Murdoch and say to Rupert Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch, we want to be on Fox. Get Geraldo Rivera yeah. on a plane, send him to Libya, and open the vault of Muammar Gaddafi and find there out what's go. in there. That man opened Al Capone's vault. Now, granted, there was nothing in it. But if there's any kind of money in this vault, Geraldo Rivera will find it. You know, this story kind of reminded me of a cross between that Al Capone vault thing and that story we did about the the uh, the artist who was living behind the wall yeah. in the Chicago. Yeah. In the Chicago Art Museum. Yes. <laughs> maybe maybe they'll open up the vault and find out now he's in the vault. It's an art Some project. Time. Yeah, or maybe it's David Copperfield. We haven't seen him for a few years. Yeah. He's been hiding in the vault all these years. Yeah. Have you heard anything about David Copperfield? It's like he vanished. No, the Whoa. last thing I heard about David Copperfield was there was some sex harassment lawsuit oh, against him. Somebody was there suing you go. him. There you that go. was a few that was a few years ago. And by the way, if Rupert Murdoch's new nickname catches on, Moopert, I want credit for that. Murpert. Murpert. You guys are just buddies. That's your nickname for That's him, right? right? Hey, Murphy. Hey, Mur- <laughs> Murphy. Let's play some golf, buddy. That's right. Then we'll go jump some cat intestines. Chad, I want to thank you because, and I don't thank you enough, but week after week, you find the latest <laughs> and the greatest and the most unusual news stories to present to our listener, our great listener. And I want to thank you, Chad. You are the you are definitely the ONG, the original news gangsta. All right, folks. Up next, we get the latest news and opinions on our Second Amendment rights with Larry Pratt of Gun Owners of America. And here's an interesting tease: Larry Pratt actually has a new position at Gun Owners of America, and we find out about it this week. What he's now doing within this organization. Gun Owners of America. And I asked him a really stupid question. I asked him how he started the organization, which he actually did not start, Gun Owners of America. And as soon as he was answering that question, I felt like an idiot. But Bruce. What? No, oh, I'm just lamenting that you asked that. It was actually a congressman, I believe, that started it. Nonetheless, we still talk to Larry Pratt of Gun Owners of America in a moment. How much of a geek are you? No, seriously, do you think you're a Star Wars expert? 
Well, take the hardest Star Wars quiz in the world and find out. Go to ZippyCheese.com and see how well you know the Star Wars movies. There's a quiz for the original trilogy, or, if you dare, take the quiz for the prequel trilogy. What's the name of the creature in the trash compactor in Episode 4? What was the name of the curator of the Jedi Archives in Episode 2? Go to ZippyCheese.com, take the quiz, and share with your friends. There's also a Marvel comic book quiz. Do you know obscure Marvel comic book characters? We'll find out today. That's ZippyCheese.com. And joining us this week is Larry Pratt. Larry Pratt now serves as the Executive Director Emeritus and served as Executive Director of Gun Owners of America for 30 years. GOA is a national grassroots organization representing more than 1 million American gun owners dedicated to promoting their Second Amendment freedom to keep and bear arms. GOA lobbies for the pro-gun position in Washington and is involved in firearm issues in the states. GOA's work includes providing legal assistance to those involved in lawsuits with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the Federal Firearms Law Enforcement Agency. Pratt has appeared on numerous national radio and TV programs, such as NBC's Today Show, CBS's Good Morning America, CNN's Crossfire, Larry King Live, Fox's Hannity and Combs, MSNBC's Phil Donahue, and Dan Abrams' show, and I saved the best for last, Piers Morgan's show on CNN. Those were classics. Uh, Larry Pratt, welcome to the Bruce Collins Show. Well, thanks so much for having me, and uh, I appreciate your uh, uh, still savoring the uh, Piers Morgan uh, series of programs. What a what a guy. Yeah. I always uh, enjoy bringing that up whenever I, I interview you. you. You know, my grandfather was a pastor for 50 years, and then he became a pastor emeritus. You are an executive director emeritus. How has your role changed? Um, not really a whole lot. My son Eric is now the executive director, uh, but I'm about as active as ever with uh, media work. Uh, we're heavily engaged doing a lot of radio and television. Excellent. And I don't think I've ever asked you this before, but how did Gun Owners of America come about? Well, uh, Gun Owners of America was organized by a California state senator back in the 70s, and he wanted to have a a voice in Washington where he saw the the need for a very proactive organization. And that uh, uh, meant that he, after he organized Gun Owners of America, he wanted to have uh, an office there, and yours truly has headed up the operation ever since. Uh, State Senator H.L. Richardson for uh, still is our chairman, founder and chairman, and uh, it was his vision that uh, uh, gun owners needed to have the kind of voice that uh, takes it to the other side and not waits for them. Now, obviously, one of the big news stories of the day is the tragedy in Orlando. But doesn't, uh, you know, and you you see the congressmen uh, s- having their little uh, slumber party temper tantrum. <laughs> doesn't Orlando prove, though, that gun-free zones don't work? That was the one thing that they never seemed to talk about during that whole time. Uh, they talked about how easy it was to get a gun. They talked about what kind of gun. Uh, but they never talked about the elephant in the room which was that was a place where nobody was legally able to have a gun that they might have used to defend themselves. That seems to me to be an outrage because that wasn't a one-off. That was but the latest of an untold series of mass shootings 
that have occurred in public in gun-free zones. All but three of them since 1950 have been like that. It just It's outrageous to me, and it's really somewhat perplexing. Why do we allow that to continue? And I understand this Orlando shooter, because he had been a security guard, he had actually passed background checks, didn't he? Passed background checks. He'd been a uh, apparently a fairly frequent uh, client of the club, so he's very familiar with the club, uh, and uh, he certainly wasn't on anybody's radar, as you say, because he had passed the background checks. So the, the, the whole notion that a background check is going to uh, be helpful uh, was certainly belied by uh, this man's experience because he was subjected to deeper, more extensive background checks than somebody that just simply goes in to buy a gun. And it still didn't do a bit of good. Uh, most background checks, all, it would be better to put it this way, Almost no background check is useful at all for law enforcement. Four, in the year that they did 18 million background checks, four resulted in prosecutions. Hmm. What a nothing burger that thing is. It keeps taking attention away from the need, which is to make it so people can legally defend themselves. If somebody had had a gun to defend himself in that club, he would have been a lawbreaker himself. Yeah. That's unconscionable. You know, another thing that's unconscionable is the way the Democrats seem to look at San Bernardino and Orlando and not see it as terrorism. Why Why is the left so blind to what is actually going on? Well, they want to talk about guns, uh, apparently, at all costs. They've had this notion for years that violence is caused by guns, and, and particularly thing as horrible as what happened in Orlando has to be the fault of the availability of guns. And the fact that there is a common element of Muslim extremism involved in these uh, shootings, uh, not just at San Bernardino and Orlando either, uh, there was a, an aborted effort by a Muslim wannabe mass murderer who didn't like a, uh, an art exhibit that uh, Pamela, Pamela Geller who has a blog site, I think it's something like Atlas Shrug, Atlas, whatever, uh, but had drawings of Muhammad. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, Muslim snowflakes consider that to be extremely offensive and a killable offense. And so this guy packed up from Arizona, drove across halfway across the country to the Dallas area and was going to shoot the place up and uh, his bad, uh, there was an armed security guard outside who took care of business, uh, <laughs> and it was a very effective guy. But, uh, you know, that's just, it, it, there, every time, not every time, but many of these uh, mass shootings or wannabe mass shootings are occasioned by some Muslim that, that's probably been to one too many Friday sermons and got himself all jazzed up. Let's take a, uh, a look over at uh, the land that brought us Piers Morgan. Uh, recently, there was a, a sad, tragic death of a British politician. Doesn't this represent yet another event where gun control didn't work? Yeah, because one of the murder instruments that, uh, was a firearm indeed, uh, a gal up in northern England, a uh, parliamentarian on the left, uh, no doubt, was very anti-gun, and, and who knows what thoughts might have been going through her head, such as, how does he have a gun? That's illegal. Um, well, ma'am, uh, unhappily, that's what criminals do. We've been trying to tell uh, the left that that's what criminals do, and it's a fool's errand to try to eliminate the problem by passing a regulation. Actually, it ends up helping the criminals. Gun-free zones are the criminal's friend. It's a place they can go and not expect a, uh, a rapid retaliation. Uh, and it just, it, it seems quite obvious, and we just wonder why, other than the fact that their commitment to, to getting rid of guns is so intense that they can't see how much damage their views cause. Hmm. 
And it's not like other uh, instruments can't be used to kill people. There was a recent story of 50 Chinese who were murdered in a coal mine, and, and they used knives, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was a, a knife attack. There have been other similar attacks in China. There was a a British soldier, of course, unarmed. How else would you have a British soldier, right? Um, and he was knifed to death in public. Nobody even lifted a finger to help him. So the answer is actually uh, freedom and the right for law-abiding citizens to carry guns, isn't it? Yes, and also the, the uh, in addition to the means, it really makes a difference as to whether the country has a tradition of fighting back. And, you, we, you know, we just pointed to that one where the that British soldier was murdered in a, like a public square in a street. And people just watched, stood there and watched like there was some kind of reality show. Um, you would hope that in many places in the United States, um, that would not be allowed to go on. Before the cops got there, hopefully, an armed American would have pulled out a gun and said, you either stop or I shoot. Now, what is the Social Security gun ban? <laughs> It's one more evidence of how continuous is the left's assault on gun ownership, uh, particularly involving average citizens. And here you've got the Social Security Administration saying that if you've got any number of psychiatric diagnoses, uh, you may not have a gun. And it's so ridiculous that somebody that might be a veteran with PTSD, um, uh, they're going to go after him. The Veterans Administration has been doing the same thing, and uh, they they have actually had to be resisted at some points by uh, local people telling them that, uh, no, you're not going to be able to do that. But uh, the, the Congress, uh, as usual, the Republican Congress seems to be more of a spectator than part of the federal government and so the one tool that they have for sure that they can use rather directly without any great complication is for the house of representatives to say none of these funds may be used for and then whatever it might be taking guns away from social security recipients um, unless uh, due process of law has been followed or however you want to word it uh, but th that sort of language to defund these anti-gun initiatives from the federal government have not taken place. And so the Republican majority just uh, sits on the bench. They don't go out on the field. They don't fight. Uh, Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, the two Republican leaderships, the House and the Senate respectively, they're useless. So we know Hillary Clinton, if, if God forbid, if she is elected, she will be anti-Second Amendment. Do you hold out any hope that Trump will be pro-Second Amendment? Well, we can hope. Um, it, Trump uh, uh, is someone who is licensed to carry a concealed firearm. Uh, that's encouraging, but that's not, I don't think, in and of itself enough to convince anybody that he would view that as something other people should be able to do. Never heard him speak with approval about the 12 states that now have laws that say um, uh you can put a gun in your purse, in your pocket, and just carry it concealed without any government permission whatsoever. I mean, Donald Trump had to go through lots of red tape, and because he was a well-known and wealthy applicant, he was able to get his permit. Uh, so the system worked for him, uh, but it doesn't work for hundreds of thousands of other people just in New York City alone. Uh, it, it's a dreadfully discriminatory system. And uh, I'm not sure that he's got a fire burning under him. He did make a statement that uh, Orlando could have been very different had a couple of people had concealed firearms uh, in that venue. Well, uh, that was a good thing to say. Uh, hopefully that might be something that would impel him to lead the charge. There's not a whole lot he could do in the federal government. But he he can use it as a bully pulpit, and he can, he, well, ultimately, if he really wanted to play hardball, which I don't see, 
he could say that uh, a state that uh, has laws like Florida's, where you can't have a gun in certain places where you very well ought to have a gun, uh, like in that uh, bar, There's, there are many, many, many states in this country that have laws dealing with how people can carry firearms in bars. Mm-hmm. So it's not uh, something that uh, is unheard of or impossible. Uh, I've been to Europe where, uh, uh, in fact, I was uh, in Switzerland at a shooting contest, a national contest. People came from all over Switzerland. They went to this army base. And after a round or two of shooting in the morning, they repaired to the mess hall for lunch and their machine guns, which is what they were using for target practice on semi-auto, of course, but nevertheless, these were full-auto machine gun capable firing full auto, they had them propped up against uh, the sides of the mess hall, unattended, uh, propped up against uh, their uh, lunch tables, kind of like picnic tables, uh, and uh, almost unattended. Certainly, they weren't under great scrutiny. And the thing that would just kill most uh, uh, Americans who are involved in uh, supervising competitions here in the United States they had a fountain in the middle of the room, this long mm-hmm. mess hall, um, and people would go up to the fountain with their mug and uh, fill it up with beer. <laughs> they absolutely had a, a mug or two, a beer at lunch, and then they went out and shot again. And uh, anybody that thinks that their ability to shoot was impaired should have seen the scores I was seeing. It was unbelievable. <laughs> wow. So, so uh, uh, it, nobody got drunk, let me hasten to add. I mean, it was yeah. one or two drinks on a full stomach, uh, it's, but it's clearly a different culture, and some of our uh, uh, great concern about mixing alcohol and and firearms is cultural. And I don't have a problem with that. I'm not going to try to change it here in the United States, but I've seen where it can be done differently, and it certainly... <laughs> To uh, quote the movie, nobody shot their eye out. Mm-hmm. You know, I was raised in a, a conservative Christian home, and I'm a, a conservative. I would consider myself a conservative. I'm a registered Republican. I was too young to vote for Ronald Reagan, but I was a big admirer of his presidency. And, uh, you know, I, I've looked over the years and seen the, the values and, and the principles that guided this country as being eroded away. And I, I look at the media today, and it's, it's total propaganda leaning to the left, every story. Um, so I have to wonder, and, and that works. That seems to work on some level. It chips away on people's uh, and there are various reasons, but the morality in this country among some people is has disintegrated. Um, I wonder how that's worked, though, with guns. Uh, w- for instance, when the Democrats are, are pouting in Congress and they're rewriting civil rights songs to, to, sound, to rhyme with gun, does this really help their, their plans? Happily, uh, it seems to me, uh, the push that the left makes against guns is counterproductive every time they try it. That's and when members of the House of Representatives were sitting on the floor of the House uh, in an all-night sleep-in, I guess we could say, uh, it, it it didn't really cow the pro-Second Amendment folks. Uh, one of the uh, reactions that I saw to what the members were doing, of Congress were doing, was – Uh, to take a picture of the members who were sitting on the floor of the House of Representatives, and they had photoshopped pacifiers into each one of their mouths. (laughs) You know, they didn't get no respect. (laughs) So uh, Americans are uh, not that easily cowed yet, it would seem. Uh, People uh, say, well, you don't like guns, that's that's your call, but... uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we have to agree with you, and if you're trying to force it down our throat, don't expect us to respect you. Mm-hmm. You know, I, <laughs> exactly. You know, I have, a, a, I think, an interesting question for you, and I asked this to Phyllis Schlafly several years ago, and I was just interested if she had any advice for, say, a conservative who wanted to 
uh, do something proactive. And the fact that they're going to get attacked from the left, that's, that's obvious. So I asked Phyllis Schlafly, did that ever affect you? And, she, and her words, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is pretty close to what she said. She said, I don't let those creeps bother me. So I, I was wondering, I know you've received a lot of vitriol from the left. Has that ever affected you personally, and, and how do you deal with that? Well, uh, I tend to look at it as an affirmation. Yeah. Uh, uh, gee, I, I'm glad that you noticed uh, what I've been doing. Uh, I didn't expect you to agree with me, although someday maybe I will be a, a more effective proponent of my views, and even the hard left will uh, will come around. But I'm not really expecting them to agree. Uh, what uh, is at play are those Americans who are not politically engaged, uh, like people on the left or the right. Uh, these are the, the people that go about their lives and try to raise their families and, and do their jobs at work. And we're trying to get their attention and to show them that being able to protect themselves is a really good idea. Yeah. And uh, the fact that over the decades that I've been involved in this fight, we've seen the needle move on public opinion uh, that more and more people see gun ownership in terms of self-defense, and they approve of people being able to defend themselves. I think there's a growing recognition that uh, uh, even if the police can get to the scene of your emergency within five or ten minutes, what are you going to do for that five or ten minutes? Right. There's a sheriff up in Milwaukee County, uh, David Clark, who has a public service announcement where he basically makes that point in his announcements, talking to the citizens of Milwaukee County and asking them what are they going to do while they're waiting for his men to get there in that five or ten minutes that they're going to need. Can we count on you, he asked them. Let's let's do this together, he says. <laughs> you know, that's going to drive some people crazy. But what he's saying is the truth. Yeah, that's right. Now, before you go, uh, Larry, and again, we've been speaking with Larry Pratt once again, and it's always an honor to have him on. Before you go, tell us about Gun Owners of America. Where can people go to find out more information? How can people join, and what does your organization do? Well, we're at gunowners.org, and it's very simple. You just go there, and uh, you can sign up for free for our email alerts. Uh, we'd love to have people contribute a, uh, for a membership, but uh, frankly, we are... Uh, primarily interested in as great a number of people as possible getting those emails so that when they do, we make it easy to send uh, an email that's embedded in the alert up to the Congress, and that's where we've been able to kind of redirect where the Congress was heading because of the enormous number of email that they're getting. So go to gunowners.org and get on the email alert list and if you want to do something else besides, that's very much appreciated, but at least get those email because things happen fast, and we have to put out email quickly, and we hope people are able to act quickly. Great. Gunowners.org, Gun Owners of America, Larry Pratt. Larry Pratt, thank you so much for joining us once again this week. Thanks for having me with you. Really appreciate it. Thank you once again for joining us here on the Bruce Collins Show, where we broadcast every Thursday night at 10 p.m. right here at WWPR, 1490 a.m. Remember, God loves you. We do, too. Don't give up. <laughs>